so as long as I'm here, we might as well just keep going. Um, I apologize for the, the light fluctuations in the previous video. It's now winter, and there are no longer leaves on the trees blocking the blinding white sunlight from coming into my room and turning me into this ghost. I also have a, a tip for all of you, which is not to eat an entire bag of vinegar chips in one sitting. Your tongue will bleed. With that in mind, we have now reached Chapter 6 of Dealing with Dragons by Patricia C. Reed. Chapter 6, in which the wizards do some snooping and Simmerine snoops back. For the next three weeks, Simmerine spent most of her free time studying the fireproofing spell and collecting what ingredients she would need to cast it. A few, like the wolfsbane and feverfew, she could gather herself from the herbs that grew on the slopes of the mountains. Alianora found a little jar of hippopotamus oil among the cosmetics left by her predecessor. The unicorn water Simmerine got from Morwen, after promising her a copy of the spell if it worked. She went to Kazol about the white eagle feathers, though she was a little afraid to explain what she wanted them for. She didn't want Kazol to think that she was worried about Kazol losing her temper and accidentally roasting her. Fortunately, the dragon found the whole idea very interesting. It could be very useful. Kazel said reflectively. There are enough hot-tempered youngsters around that it will be well worth fireproofing the princesses who have to deal with them. I'm not sure I'll be able to fireproof anyone at all, Simmerine said. I still need the white eagle feathers and the ha powdered hen's teeth, and nobody seems to have any. I'll see what I can do, Kazel said, and a few days later she dropped a bundle of white feathers at the door of the kitchen. Half a feather was stuck to one of her right claws, and another was caught between two of her teeth, and she looked very pleased with herself. Simmering decided not to ask any awkward questions. Even Kazel, however, could not find any hen's teeth, so Simmering had to keep putting off trying out the spell. When she wasn't working on collecting the ingredients for the fireproofing spell, Simmering read the Historia Dracorum. It was very difficult at first. After all, it had been a long time since her last Latin lesson. She kept working at it until she started to remember the right endings for the declensions and conjugations and cases. Soon after that, she realized that she was not having to look up quite as many words as she had at the beginning. From then on, her progress was rapid. It helped that she found the book fascinating. Dragon history was not a subject commonly taught to princesses in Linderwall. But as she was now a dragon's princess, she had personal reasons to be interested. Besides, the history of the dragons was very exciting. Every page was full of descriptions of dragons ravaging villages, carrying off princesses, defeating knights and princes, and occasionally being defeated by them, and fighting with wizards, giants, and each other. When the book wasn't describing battles, it was describing famous dragons' hordes and particular dr draconian customs. Simmerine was in the library with the Historia Dracorum in front of her, and her Latin dictionary on the table beside her left hand, when she heard someone calling from the front of the cave. She had hoped it would be at least a little longer before the knight started coming back, so she couldn't help sighing as she stuck a leather bookmark in the book and closed it. Then she went out to argue with whoever it was until they went away. Two wizards were standing just outside the mouth of the cave. Simmerine saw their wooden staffs first before she was close enough to see their faces. As she came nearer, she recognized the one on the left as Zeminar. The one on the right was taller and younger. His brown hair and beard showed no trace of gray. His blue and brown robes were identical to the older wizards, except for the colors. His eyes were the same bright black as his companions, and he looked at Simmerin in a way that made her feel uneasy. "'Good morning to you, Princess Simmerin,' Zeminar said. "'I thought I would take you up on your kind invitation to visit. I hope we haven't come at an inconvenient time.' Not at all, Simmerine said, thinking hard. She had promised Kazel she would, would try and find out what Zeminar was after if he showed up, and here he was. Maybe if she convinced him that he that she was as silly as her sisters, he would be careless enough to let something slip. I thought perhaps we might, since it took you so long to come out, Zeminar said mildly. But Simmerine thought there was a hint of suspicion in his eyes. Uh, I, I must not have heard you right away. Simmerine said, biting her eyes innocently, the way her next youngest sister did whenever she had done something particularly foolish. Castle has quite a large set of caves, and I was in one of the ones at the back. I am so sorry. 
Ah! Seminar stroked his beard with his left hand. That would make it difficult for you. Perhaps we could set up a spell for you, one that would let you know whenever anyone comes to visit. Be more pleasant for visitors, too, if they didn't have to shout. What do you think, Antorell? Like the ones at the headquarters of the society, the second wizard said, nodding. We could do it in two or three minutes right from here. It, it'd be easy. Zeminar shot a dark look at his companion. Simmerine was sure that he'd wanted to pretend he was inventing a difficult new spell, so that he would have an excuse to wander around Kazel's caves. Quite so, said Zeminar. Well, princess? Oh, dear, I don't know, Simmerine said, doing her best to imitate the way her eldest sister behaved whenever anyone wanted her to decide anything. It sounds very nice, but Kazel is so picky about where things go and how things are done. No, I, I couldn't. I simply couldn't let you do anything like that without asking Kazel first. What a pity, Zeminar said. His companion coughed and shuffled his feet. Ah, yes. Allow me to present my son, Antarel. I hope you don't mind my bringing him along. Of course not, Simrian said politely. I am pleased to make the acquaintance of such a lovely princess, Antarel said, bowing. Simrian blinked. This wasn't getting anywhere. Maybe she brought them inside, they'd relax a little. Well, thank you, she said to Antarel. Won't you come in and have some tea? We would be delighted, Zeminar said quickly. If you'll lead the way, princess. This way, Simmerine said. She stopped just inside the mouth of the cave and gave the wizards her sweetest and most innocent smile. You can leave your staffs right here. Just lean them up against the wall. Antarel looked considerably startled, and Zeminar frowned. Is this, too, something your dragon requires? I don't know. Simmerine said, wrinkling up her forehead the way her third from eldest sister did whenever she was puzzled, which was often. But they'll be so awkward in the kitchen, don't you think so? There's not very much room. We'll manage, Seminar said. Simmerine hadn't really expected to get the wizards to let go of their staffs, but it had been worth a try. She shrugged and smiled and led them on into the kitchen, where she made a point of bumping into the staffs or tripping over them every time she went by. Finally, Antarel turned his sideways and stuck it under the table. Zeminar hung on to his with a kind of grim, suspicious stubbornness that made Simmerine wonder whether she was fooling him at all with her pretended silliness. The wizards made uncomfortable conversation about the weather and the size of the kitchen for several minutes while Simmerine fixed the tea and poured it. Are the rest of Kazel's cave this, this large? Zeminar asked as Simmerine handed him his teacup. She had given him the one with the broken handle even though he was a guest, because she didn't trust him. Oh, yes, Simmerine said. She was beginning to think she was never going to find out anything. The two wizards seemed perfectly happy to sit at the kitchen table and talk about nothing whatever for hours. Remarkable, Antarell said in an admiring tone. You know, we wizards don't often get to see the inside of a dragon's cave. I'll bet you don't, thought Simmerine as she gave him a puzzled smile. Well, that's too bad, she said aloud. Oh, yes, it is, Zeminar said. Perhaps you'd be willing to show us around. Simmerine thought rapidly. It was obvious that she wasn't going to learn anything if the wizards just sat at the kitchen table and drank tea, so she decided to take a chance. Well, she said in a doubtful tone, I suppose it would be all right, as long as I don't take you into the treasure rooms. That, that's fine, Antarell said a little too quickly. You won't touch anything, will you? Simmerine said as they stood up. Kazel is so particular about where things are kept. Of course not, Zeminar said, smiling insincerely. Simmerine smiled back, and she led the way out into the hall. She watched the wizards carefully as she took them through the large main cave, the general storage caverns, and the big cavern where Kazel visited with other dragons. Zeminar made polite noises about the size and comfort of everything. But he, neither he nor Antarel seemed very interested. And this is the library, Simmerine said, throwing the door open. I am impressed, Zeminar said, and Simmerine could tell that this time he meant it. She stepped sideways so that she could keep an eye on both of the wizards at the same time. A remarkable collection, Antarel commented. He began walking around the room, admiring the bookshelves and scanning the titles of the books. 
What's this? Zeminar said, bending over the table. The Historia Dracorum? A surprising choice for light reading, princess. His eyes met Semarine's, and they were hard and bright and suspicious. Oh, I'm not reading it, Semarine said hastily, opening her eyes very wide. I just thought it would make the library look nicer to have a book or two sitting out on the table. More, more lived in. Zeminar nodded, looking relieved and faintly contemptuous. I think it works very well, princess, he said. Very well indeed. Then he looked over at the other side of the room and said sharply, Antarel, what are you doing? Semarine turned her head in time to see Antarel put out a hand and deliberately tip several books off one of the shelves. Stop that, she said, forgetting to sound silly. I'm very sorry, princess, Antarel said. Will you help me put them back where they belong? Semarine had no choice but to go over and help him. It took several minutes to get everything back in place because Antarel kept dropping things. Semarine got quite annoyed with him and finally did it all herself. As she started to turn back to the center of the room, she caught a glimpse of Zeminar hastily closing the Historia Dracorum. Semarine pretended not to notice, but she made a mental note that he had been looking at something near the middle of the book. That was dreadfully careless of you, Semarine said, frowning at Antarel. Very clumsy, Seminar agreed. I don't know what Kazel will say when she finds out about it, Semarine went on. Really, it is too bad of you. I did ask you not to touch anything, you know. Oh, yes, you did, Seminar said. And I wouldn't like to think that we had gotten you in trouble. Perhaps it would be best if you didn't mention to Kazel that we were here at all. I suppose I could do that, Semarine said in a doubtful tone. Of course you can, Antarel said encouragingly. And I'll come back in a few days to make sure everything's all right. I think it's time we were on our way, Zeminar said, giving his son a dark look. Thank you for showing us around, princess. Semarine escorted them out of the cave and made sure they had left, then hurried back to the library. She spent the next several hours poring over the middle parts of the Historia Dracorum, trying to figure out what Zeminar had been looking at. She was still there when Kazel arrived home and called for her. That wizard Zeminar finally came, and he brought his son along with him, Semarine said as she came out of the library. I know, said Kazel. Her voice sounded a little thick, as if she had a cold. I could smell them the minute I came in. Is that why you sound so odd? Semarine asked. You're not going to sneeze, are you? I don't think so, Kazel replied. Don't worry about it. I'll have plenty of time to turn my head away. I wish I could get hold of some hen's teeth, Simmerine said, frowning. That fireproofing spell? Have you looked in the treasure rooms? Kazel asked. No. Simmerine remembered seeing a number of jars and bottles of various shapes and sizes when she had been organizing the treasure, and none of them had been labeled. I didn't think of it. And besides, it's your treasure. Well, you're my princess. At least until someone rescues you or I decide otherwise, Kazel pointed out. Go ahead and look, and if you find any hen's teeth, use them. Be careful when you're checking the jars, though. There are one or two with lead stoppers that shouldn't be opened. Lead stoppers, Simmerine said. I'll remember. Good. Now what did those wizards want? I'm not sure. Simmerine explained everything that had happened, including how she had seen Zeminar closing the history book as she turned, and how the two wizards had been perfectly willing to leave right after that. But just before they disappeared, Antarel said he might come back another time, Semarine concluded. So I don't know whether they found what they were looking for or not. Do you know what part of the Historia Dracorum Zeminar was reading? Kazel asked. Well, somewhere in the middle, a little past my bookmark, Semarine replied. I was just looking at it when you came in. It's the part about the how the dragons came into the Mountains of Morning and settled into the caves and chose a king. That's the section where the Historia describes the caves of fire and night, isn't it? Kazel said. Simmerine nodded. There was a whole page about somebody finding a stone in the cave so that the dragons could pick a king. It didn't make much sense to me. Ah, Colin Stone, Kazel said, nodding. We've used it to choose our king ever since the first time. When a king dies, all the dragons go to the ford of whispering snakes in the enchanted forest and take turns trying to move Colin Stone from there to the vanishing mountain. The one that succeeds is the next king. 
What if there are two dragons strong enough to move it? Semarine asked. It's not a matter of strength. Colin's stone isn't much larger than you are. Even a small dragon could carry that much weight twice around the enchanted forest with no trouble at all. But Colin's stone has an aura, a kind of vibration. When you carry it, you can feel it humming through your claws, and the humming gets stronger the farther you go until your bones are shaking. Most dragons have to drop it, or be shaken to pieces. But there's always one who is suited to the stone. For that dragon, the stone's humming is just a pleasant buzz, so of course it's easy to get it to the vanishing mountain. You sound as if you've had experience, Simmerine said. Of course, Kazel responded matter-of-factly. I was old enough to participate in the tests when the last king died. She smiled reminiscently. I got farther than anyone expected me to, although I wasn't one of the top ten by any means. Semarine tilted her head to one side, considering. I think I'm glad you didn't win. Oh, why is that? Kazel sounded amused. Because if you wouldn't have had any use for a princess if you were the queen of the dragons, and if you hadn't decided to take me on, that yellow-green dragon Morans would probably have eaten me, Samarine explained. You mean, if I were the king of the dragons, Kazel corrected her. Queen of the dragons is a dull job. But you're a female, Samarine said. If you'd carried Colin Stone from the fort of Whispering Snakes to the Vanishing Mountain, you'd have had to be a queen, wouldn't you? No, of course not, Kazel said. Queen of the Dragons is a totally different job from King, and it's not one I'm particularly interested in. Most people aren't. I think the position's been vacant since Auron tore his wing and had to retire. But King Tarkoz is, is a male dragon, Semarine said, then frowned. Isn't he? Yes, yes, but that has nothing to do with it, Kazel said a little testily. King is the name of the job. It doesn't matter who holds it. Semarine stopped and thought for a moment. You mean that dragons don't care whether their king is male or female. The title is the same no matter who the ruler is. That's right. We like to keep things simple. Oh. Simmering decided to return to the original topic of conversation. Why would the wizards be interested in Colin Stone if it's only used for picking out the kings of the dragons? I doubt that, that they are, Kazel replied. However, Colin Stone was found in the Caves of Fire and Night, and wizards have always been interested in the caves. But the dragons control most of them, and all the easy entrances are ours, so the wizards have never been able to find out as much as they would like. The Historia Dracorum is one of the few books that talks about the cave at all, and there aren't many copies. I'll wager Zeminar would have stolen it outright if he thought he could get away with it. I thought the dragons let wizards into the Caves of Fire and Night, Simmerine objected. Why would Zeminar be poking through the history books looking for information if he can just go and look at them whenever he wants to? Ah, uh, we don't let wizards visit the caves whenever they want, Kazel said. If we did, they'd be running in and out all the time, and nobody would be able to breathe without sneezing. No, they're limited to certain days and times, and if they want to visit the caves of fire and night otherwise, they have to use one of the entrances we don't control. Few of them try. Other ways of getting into the caves are very dangerous, even for wizards. Maybe they're looking for an easier way in. Hmm. Kazel did not seem to be paying much attention. She thought for a moment, then turned toward the cave mouth. I'm going to see Gorim. Roxim said a book had been stolen from her library, and I want to know which one. I'll be back in a few hours. I think I'll go look at the Historia Dracorum again while you're gone, Simmerine said. If there is something useful in it about the caves of fire and night, maybe I can find it now that I know what I'm looking for. Simmerine spent the rest of the afternoon after carefully translating the chapter that talked about the caves. She was disappointed to find that there was very little about the caves themselves, though what was there was interesting. The book told how the dragons had discovered the back way into the caves and described some of the things they had found in them. Caverns full of blue and green fire, pools of black liquid that would cast a cloud of darkness for twenty miles around if you poured three drops on the ground, walls made of crystal that multiplied every sound a thousandfold, rocks that spurted fire when they were broken. Most of the rest of the chapter was about Colin Stone, and how it was taken out of the caves by the very first king of the dragons. Kazel returned just before dinner, and she and Simmerine compared notes. Semarine told Kazel what she had learned from the chapter on the Caves of Fire and Night, 
and then Castle explained what she had learned from Garim. The stolen book was The Kings of the Dragons, and the entire first section was about Colin Stone in the Caves of Fire and Night, Castle said. And only a wizard could have gotten past the spells and safeguards Garim puts on her library. I think that settles it. The wizards are definitely collecting information about the Caves of Fire and Night. Then why do they keep looking at books of dragon history? Simmerine asked. It seems like a roundabout way of finding out whatever it is that they want to know. There isn't any other way to do it, Kazel said. Nobody but dragons has ever had much to do with the caves, and no one has written much about them except in dragon histories. Even the wizards weren't particularly interested in them until a few years ago, except as a reliable route into the enchanted forest. But from what I've been reading in the Historia Dracorum, the caves sound fascinating, Simmerine said. You mean to tell me that no one has ever written anything about the caves of fire and night except dragons? That's... Casal stopped suddenly and her eyes narrowed. No, that's not right. There was a rather rumpled scholar who talked his way into the caves a century or so back, and after he left he wrote an extremely dry book about what he found there. I'd forgotten about him. Well, do you have a copy? Simmerine asked hopefully. No. But I don't think the Society of Wizards does, either. There weren't very many of them printed, and a lot of those were lost in a flood a few years later. Some hero or other shoved a giant into a lake to drown him. The silly clunch didn't realize that if he put something that big into a lake, the water would have to go somewhere. Well, that doesn't do as much good, Simmerine said. It's nice that the Society of Wizards doesn't have a copy of the book, but if we can't get hold of one either... I didn't say that, Kazel said. I don't have a copy myself, but I know who does. Who? Simmerine said impatiently. Morwen, I'm afraid you're not going to be able to work on that fireproofing spell of yours tomorrow. We're going to take a trip to the Enchanted Forest instead. <laughs>